Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Royal Aeronautical Society Heathrow branch webinar. My name is William Lee, and I'm the Honorary Secretary of the branch and the moderator for today's session. Today, we are delighted to welcome some excellent speakers to this special webinar, paying our tribute to the Boeing 747 Jumbo Jet, the Queen of the Skies. Joining us today is Captain L. Bridger, the Director of Flight Operations at British Airways. Captain Hill Dibley, a distinguishing pilot and a 747 training captain, and Senior First Officer Eleanor McBrien, committee member of the RAES Heathrow branch, as well as branch chairman Peter Fire, who will be chairing today's webinar. Thanks, William, for the introduction to today's virtual lecture by webinar. Hello, I'm Pete Fryer, the chairman of the London Heathrow branch of the Royal Aeronautical Society. I'm exceptionally pleased this lunchtime to be able to welcome you all to the six of this season's lectures presented as webinars. Well, the extraordinary year 2020 and the Christmas celebrations are now behind us. We're now well into the year 2021, so I take this opportunity in wishing you all my personal very best wishes and the best wishes of the branch committee for the year 2021. Thank you very much for giving up your valuable time to be delegates in this afternoon's event. Finally, I wish to check that you're in good health. I do hope that you're all keeping well through the upheaval caused by this tenacious and dangerous virus. Today, we will have a very special and spontaneous event to entertain and thrill you. It's planned as the farewell tribute to the Boeing 747 Jumbo Jet, the Queen of the Skies. The Boeing 747 has gracefully filled the skies over Heathrow for 51 years, yes, 51. As a teenager, an aircraft enthusiast and spotter, I personally remember watching the first 747 production aircraft, November 736 PA, the Pan American World Airways route proving flight arriving at Heathrow from New York on the 12th of January 1970. 1970. This aircraft, by the way, later reached notorious fame as the very aircraft that was involved in the world's worst accident with a KLM 747 on a foggy runway at Tenerife Nord Airport. A few days later, just after lunch on the 22nd of Jan 1970, I can also remember seeing the Pan Am call sign Clipper 2 it was November 747 PA, the first 747 aircraft carrying commercial fare paying passengers, which arrived seven hours late due to tech issues. By pure chance, today is the 51st anniversary of that event, almost exactly to the day, which is tomorrow. British Airways and its predecessor, the British Overseas Airways Corporation, has operated the type from the earliest 747-100 series through the 1970s, right up to the 747-400 variants, which arrived in 1989 and retired from service in 2020. Over the period, the aircraft has been considered a global icon, the queen of the skies, with British Airways leading the operation of the type at one time as the world's largest operator. Today, we're delighted to have two British Airways people who knew the, B the Boeing 747 best to host this special webinar, paying tribute to the dedicated service of the type. Today will be an event in two halves. The event will start with Captain Alistair Bridger, Director of Flight Operations at British Airways, who will give us a short presentation of his recollection of the Queen of the Skies. Al qualified as a pilot at the age of 17 and followed a career in both the armed forces and in the civilian airlines. I'm sure he'll tell you more about himself later. Um, as it is, in his current role, Al is responsible for the safe and efficient operations of all British Airways aircraft. As a final claim to fame, Al was one of the pilots to fly the last of the BA Jumbos to their last resting place during last October and December. The second half of the event will be a light-hearted panel event discussing your questions and providing answers. We will be joined by a very good friend of the Royal Aeronautical Society, one who's well known to all members of the Heathrow branch, Captain Hugh Dibley, Fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Hello, Hugh. 
Captain Hugh has flown many aircraft types during the span of his distinctive flying career. In BOAC, he flew DC-7s, Britannia's, Comets, 707s, whilst later piloting 707s, 747s and Tri-Stars. He became BA's flight manager, technical, training captain, CAA authorised examiner, flight test pilot and chairman of BA's fuel policy and conservation committee. Upon retiring, he had many other uh, distinguished jobs, such as being the director of operations and chief pilot for the president of the UAE and many others. Hugh has been much involved in the work of the society. He's been a member of many Royal Aeronautical Society specialist groups and was the long time chairman of the Toulouse branch and member of the RAS committee. Over the past 40 years, he has presented many papers on fuel conservation, operational efficiency, and many other subjects. The panel will be chaired by Senior First Officer Eleanor Bryan, member of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Since 2012, Ellie has been an active member of the committee of the Heathrow branch. She enjoys working both with the main society and within the branch to encourage young people to follow their passion in aviation and aerospace. Ellie studied aerospace engineering at the University of Manchester, before accepting a place on the BA Future Pilot Programme midway through her studies. She currently flies the short haul network on the Airbus 320 fleet out of Heathrow and as a pilot ambassador for British Airways, she provides an insight for young people wishing to make a career in the airline industry. I will now pass you over to Al Bridger, who after a short video will present his lecture, Farewell to the Queen of the Skies. Al, a very big welcome as a speaker to the Royal Aeronautical Society's London Heathrow branch. Thank you. I'm Al Bridger. I'm the director of flight operations. I'm also a 747 captain. So today, it's, it's an emotional special day. So we couldn't just see the 747s disappear. So we'll be taking the last two aircraft out today and then we'll be flying back round and then doing a final goodbye fly through of the airfield. I think they'll remember her as being good looking, elegant and a, and a real friend. I mean, over the years, there were 57 of the 400s here, over the years they've been an integral part of, of the BA family. And I think uh, this week there'll be some sadness when the, when the last two go off. I think the reason I love the 747 so much is it's the one aircraft that I always wanted to fly on as crew. Um, it just, it gets you in your heart. Uh, whenever I see her anywhere, I just get that flutter and I always think to myself, I'm so proud that I worked on a British Airways 747. Freebird 747, thank you. Behind the departing company 747, line up runway 27 right behind. Behind the departing company 747, line up 27 right behind. Freebird 747. Runway 27 right, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, runway 27 right, Freebird 747. Freebird 747. Clear for a low approach and go around, not below height 500 feet. After go around, climb straight ahead to altitude 6,000 feet. Thanks so much for all your help guiding us over the years. It's been uh, an absolute pleasure to fly the Queen of the Skies and thank you for helping us commemorate her departure today. That's a final farewell from uh, British Airways. Goodbye. Bye bye. Well, I get emotional watching that still. Uh, what a great video. I really, I really do enjoy it. So firstly, thank you so, so much for inviting me to, uh, to come along and speak to you today. Uh, I was uh, asked if I wanted to come and talk about the, the Queen of the Skies, the 747. And uh, those of you who know me will know that any excuse to talk about the 747, uh, I will gratefully uh, take up. So what a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to to um, to come along. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about me. Um, I know you want to hear about the Queen of the Skies, but I thought it's only fair to give you a little bit of background on me. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, the history of the aircraft. I'm probably not the best qualified, but we have the wonderful Hugh with us today. Uh, I'll talk you through a bit of the history of the 747 with British Airways and then a um, bit about the aircraft itself. A few of my memories as well. And then, of course, uh, that final flight that you just saw the uh, the video there. So hopefully that will um, that will be OK. 
So my career to date, and I will rattle through it because uh, it's it's quite pictorial. This um, these these uh, lectures. So uh, having said that, the first um, slide is all um, words and text. So I'll rattle through it, but I do have some pictures. I promise. So it's not all words. So I was um, very fortunate way back in the mid '80s there to get a flying scholarship with the Air Force. I um, didn't really have a way into flying. I'd, my, I had uh, no relatives that particularly were in flying. I uh, could, certainly couldn't afford to go and pay for it. Um, so the Air Cadets was my wonderful way in, and I am eternally grateful to the Air Cadets. Anyone has anything to do with them, I am hugely, hugely grateful. So that set me off on the path. Managed to get a, um, a PPL at 17, which was quite cool, really, going back to school with uh, with my flying license while everyone else had a driving license. Um, um, but mid 80s, I absolutely desperately wanted to be an airline pilot. And um, as you will know, those of you around in the mid 80s was not great for getting airline jobs. So I, uh, I joined the RAF, they very kindly took me on, um, which was an absolute treat. And then I made the kind of mistake going through training of saying I want to be an airline pilot. Um, I want to fly TriStars and, and VC-10s. And uh, everyone was just, you, know, you don't really want to do that. Uh, you want to fly something a, a little bit faster. And I ended up, to be fair, on the Phantom. And um, they were right. The Phantom was a fabulous aeroplane. I was 21 flying them to start with and then I flew that for three years and then the aircraft retired, which is a, a bit of a habit in my career, aircraft retire um, that I've flown. So I did that, flew the Hawk as a, a qualified flying instructor, uh, got to a decision point and this airline thing was still burning. So I went off to a company called Air 2000 and uh, went and flew the 757 for them. Very, very lucky in the fact that I uh, managed to get a command having never um, flown an airliner before. I was in the left-hand seat after two years, which was amazing, amazing learning curve, which was great. But the call of British Airways in the 747 was still there. So as amazing as they were, I went off and joined British Airways and very, very lucky that they happened to be recruiting onto the 747 at that time. So I went uh, straight in as a uh, first officer on the 747, flying worldwide. And uh, back then, we were doing some pretty long trips actually down to Australia, all over the world. It was the, the fleet that covered all the ultra long haul range flying. So um, very lucky to have done that. Again, the, the call of training got me again and uh, managed to become a training co-pilot on the 747, which was quite interesting. Um, as a training co-pilot in British Airways, you're an examiner and an instructor. So you can run sim checks on the most senior um, captain in the company, which was amazing because I was only a little two ringer at the time, brand new first officer. Um, so what a treat. And, and I think I learned far more from those sessions than, uh, than any of the people that I trained or checked, which was wonderful. Again, back to the call of uh, management and the 747 technical manager um, um, role came along and I thought, well, I'll throw my hat in the ring and uh, I managed to start my management career as the technical manager on the 747, which was which was interesting. Um, quite a steep learning curve. Um, from there, off to be a training manager at Gatwick, training again, um, this time on the 737, so Boeing man really through and through. And then the chief pilot role came up, which I uh, was very fortunate to get. And then back in 09, we were looking at the business and restructuring it down at Gatwick, and we turned it into what was effectively a, uh, a mini director of flight operations role and I became the head of flight operations down at Gatwick. And then in 2013, back up to um, Heathrow as the chief pilot on the Boeing fleets, back on the jumbo again. And then in 2018, became the director of flight operations. So that's the sort of um, the rattle through what I've done, just to sort of show you what I have been through and pictorially we'll, uh, we'll look at it. Um, so actually, I thought I'd put some pictures together. You, you all know what all these aircraft are anyway, but but I put it together and then it dawned on me on the slide, exactly as I've just said, that everything I seem to fly seems to retire, um, which is is uh, interesting. So the Phantom, obviously the bottom, that went when I was on it. The Hawk T Mark 1A, that's um, flown by the Red Arrows and not a lot else these days. The Classic 737, again, not many of those around. We saw those leave British Airways as well. And then the beautiful uh, 747, fabulous shot of it there. Um, and we retired that as well. So um, I'm off to the 777 next, if anyone's on the triple, just, just out of interest. So hopefully I won't be around to retire that one as well. And of course, the magnificent 75, beautiful first airliner. So that was the uh, aircraft I flew. So most of them sadly off to museums now. Um, and then just to prove that I actually did fly those aircraft, I've got a, uh, a picture or two of me, a few, few retro shots, as it were, um, of some young boy that I barely recognise. Um, the ones of interest there really are the, um, the top 
right, I don't know how well you can see it, uh, that is somebody who's looking immensely relieved. Um, the aircraft in the background there is the Jet Provost T Mark 5A, wonderful piece of kit, and that is a very relieved Al who's just been around his first jet solo um, with a look of crikey, how did I survive that on my face after um, a very, very exciting, um, well landing probably was the most exciting bit, but that was brilliant. And then the, um, the bottom one there, um, looking, uh, you're just relaxing, I think. And uh, that is the nose leg of a Phantom, obviously. And that's down in Ascension Island. So we've taken a few aircraft down there on our way to the Falklands. That was a, a nine hour trip down to Ascension, but that's a story for another day. So that's me relaxing after what was quite a long and, um, and uh, interesting flight down. So, um, so that's kind of a potted history of Al, just so you know, um, um, me and what I've done. So we move on to the, um, the history now and, um, I have to say the history of the 747 or history in general is not my not my forte but of course we have got the wonderful Hugh with us today who is who's um involved in perhaps the earlier part of some of this history so Hugh if I'm making a complete um fool of myself at any stage on this please feel free to uh, to jump in and um and correct me if that's possible so I'll uh, I'll make sure I get this right so the history of the 747 goes back to obviously as we've already said back in the 70s now I always think of this as the age of Apollo um, I'm an absolute space nut as well. Love all the moon landing um, things as well. Uh, so this is the age of Apollo. So what an amazing time to to be around. Um, and this is the, when the aircraft was born. And I think I was pretty sure it was all BOAC at the time. We ordered our first aircraft back in 1966, which incredibly, I, I know you won't believe it. That was the year I was born um, back in World Cup year 66. So the first aircraft was uh, delivered in uh, 1970. Golf Alpha Whiskey November Alpha, I believe. Um, and that was uh, delivered back then. As I say, there was a few teething problems with the early aircraft, as uh, Peter's already said, uh, some engine issues with it. But I think there was a few teetering problems with the um, with the um, the staff and colleagues at British Airways at the time as well, because there were some industrial issues that went on, which meant that the aircraft were pretty much parked up um, for almost a year before the first flight off to uh, to New York. Um, in April 71, I think it was. So um, the first aircraft was um, sent off. Uh, that was Gulf Alpha Whiskey November Foxtrot. And I think it went twice weekly. And then pretty shortly after that, um, we added Chicago and Miami. Um, and for those of you not familiar with the, the, the first, the, the 100s, if you ever get a chance to go to the absolutely incredible British Airways Heritage Centre uh, when it opens up, after COVID, um, it's it's amazing in there, and they've got all sorts of information about the early aircraft. I believe it had um, 27 first class seats, was my understanding, and 315 economy seats, and then obviously the the magical spiral staircase up to the lounge on the upper deck, and I believe you could get 16 people up there on the upper deck. So absolutely uh, an amazing uh, amazing aircraft to fly, and an absolute quantum leap forward in terms of flying and opening up the world. It's so that first flight uh, went in um, uh, 1971. So in uh, 1973, uh, we got the 15th aircraft that was delivered to the original BOAC, and that was the 222nd off the production line. Um, and then obviously uh, BOAC and BEA um, merged back in March 74, and the new British Airways was born. And then the, the last of the, um, aircraft was delivered there back in April 1976. So at that stage we had um, a lot of 100s and they were flying pretty much worldwide. Um, so that was the sort of history of the uh, original 100 aircraft and then the 200 aircraft came along and this is really be where you can ask your questions of Hugh when we get to the question and answer session because this is Hugh's real forte. So as we know Rolls-Royce um, created the absolutely magnificent RB211 aircraft that has powered me for many, many hours of my flying career. An incredible piece of kit, but obviously a very expensive piece of kit. And I think it pretty much bankrupted Rolls-Royce at the time. So um, British Airways, as was then, um, took the uh, Rolls-Royce engines onto the 200s. And they were the first aircraft to be delivered with those Rolls-Royce engines. And some of them um, came from all over the place. So some of the 200s we had um, were dry leased in. Um, and I believe, obviously when we merged with British Caledonian, we took um, a further few aircraft as well. So a real history of, of different aircraft um, in terms of the, the 200s. 
in amongst all that, I think we had the, um, the cargo aircraft. I just mentioned it because it was only a, a small sort of blip in the history of the 74 with British Airways, G Kilo, aptly named. Um, but we only had that for a short period and then that was transferred off to Cathay Pacific. And then in 1989, in July 89 to be uh, specific, the first of the um, 400 aircraft joined us. And this is obviously what uh, I'm quite, quite a bit more familiar with. So the, the big changes in this, it was developed from the 300, for those of you that know, that had the extended upper deck, um, but they added the, the winglets onto the aircraft and it became a uh, glass cockpit aircraft as well, which was a real step forward after the, the 75 was the first aircraft to do that. So we took delivery of the first of those and then built up the fleet over the years, as it says there, up to uh, 19. 99 uh, when the last of the 747s were delivered and obviously I joined the company in 97 so it was probably the only time in my career I was flying new aircraft as opposed to aircraft at the end of their lives which was quite a treat if I recall. Um, so we had 57 of those in the fleet which was enormous I mean I think, I think it was the biggest fleet uh, operating in the world um, at the time. Gradually over time uh, we have replaced the aircraft and the fleet reduced down to about 31 aircraft I believe um, but over that time, we'd, we'd um, improved the aircraft. We'd spent a, a lot of money on upgrading the, the cabins. If anyone had been on one of the last aircraft, it had a beautiful uh, new Panasonic uh, in-flight entertainment, a fabulous um, cabin, uh, really great bit of kit. And the, um, the flight management computer as well, we'd really updated it. It was, it was absolutely top spec. Um, and this meant that the aircraft were fantastic and, and they were very much um, looking to operate them to at least the sort of 2024, somewhere like that. Um, to keep them going. They're a real um, major part of our fleet. But of course, then, uh, as we all know, um, history has taken over in the last year. And those plans obviously had to change, which was very, very sad um, for all of us on the on the um, 747 uh, after the amazing, amazing history that, that this aircraft has had with our uh, with our business. So we started to um, release or retire as it were the last um, 30 odd aircraft and they went uh, all over the place so we've had some that have been down to to Spain and uh, they've all kept fairly close actually no, none that have gone over to um, the States a lot in the UK as you'll see they've been to a bit to uh, St Athens and Kemble um, and they the last of those as we saw on that video there in October 20 um, the last one departed Heathrow and I was uh, utterly privileged to uh, to have been able to be at the controls and to to uh, be the captain on the last one of those. So that was amazing. A little bit more of that um, later on. And then I'll just mention there as well that we did store a bunch of aircraft or a number of them in uh, Cardiff as well. And the uh, last one of those in December, um, the beautiful, beautiful BOAC liberated aircraft um, left Cardiff. And I think it was about 14 minutes later, it arrived in um, St. Athens. So here's some pictures again. As I said, I keep it heavy on pictures. Um, so the top left one there is, is the, one of the uh, beautiful BOAC livery 100s. Um, that's uh, a very, very handsome chap second from the left there, the, the magnificent Hugh Dibley there with a, uh, a, a 200 series, um, 7.4. I believe he was delivering those. Um, Hugh was involved closely in that uh, and also flying some of the uh, aircraft away at the end of the lines as well. And then top right is the delivery uh, ceremony of the 400s arriving in july um, and then the bottom picture there is a picture of the g kilo the cargo aircraft that we had just for a brief amount of time so as i say a 50 plus year history with um, british airways and its predecessors um, and absolutely a core part of uh, of the business that, that we have and it's been a magnificent magnificent ser servant to the business and to the uk so in terms of the actual aircraft itself, I thought I'd give you a, a, a bit of an idea on it. It's, um, I mean, I'm sure some of you may have uh, may have operated them. So excuse me if I'm teaching you to suck eggs here. But the first thing to say is it is big. It is an enormous aircraft. And, and when I first started flying it back in 97, um, it was obviously the biggest thing around. There were no 380s or anything else. So this was uh, all, all triple um, 300. So a very, very, very big aircraft. Uh, and it really strikes you first time you get up close to it. Um, it is just enormous um, and uh, you know, an amazing, amazing piece of engineering. Just just Boeing just got everything right. I can't speak highly um, enough of the aircraft. It's absolutely um, fantastic. So um, you might be wondering why there's a picture of a building on the uh, on the right hand side there. But 
the thing to note there is uh, there's a couple of little scribbled on circles on there and this is our old training center it's called crane bank a magnificent place um and uh Pilots will not have great memories of it because it's where you go and do your sim checks, or we used to, um, and so a little bit of dread and fear there. But uh, there it is. And the two little circles are interesting because if you look at the, um, the top circle, right at the top of the building there, that is actually, there's a little marker in the middle of that circle that was on the building, which was the um, pilot's eye height as you went into the flare. So there you go. Thanks, William. It's um, That is a long way up. You are a long way up when you're uh, flaring this aircraft, so it looks very strange. The bottom circle there is um, the eye height when you're actually sat on the flight deck. Again, you're a long way up for a, for a conventional aircraft. And that's probably the first thing you notice when you first fly the aircraft. You get up to the flight deck, you strap in and you are a long way up um, and that feels quite odd. So there's a few issues with that. Um, first one is uh, just taxiing the aircraft round on the ground. And there's a few few bits to think about on that. The first one is it's very big. So if you can see on the on the picture on the left there, the, the nose wheel is actually behind the flight deck. So you end up going very wide on turns um, and you're also a, a long way up. So at times you feel like you're over the grass when you're taxiing to keep the main wheels on the uh, on the taxiway, which is which is quite amazing. And um, because you're so high up, it's a bit like the opposite of a racing car, as you will know. When you're very low down, you feel like you're going very fast, even if you're not. But when you're very high up, you feel like you're going very slow when you're going very fast. So you have to keep a really good eye on your speed as you taxi this aircraft around. And the other thing I have to admit, and I don't admit many things about the 747 not being perfect, but the nose wheel is not actually ideal. If you look at the size of that aircraft there and then the size of the nose wheel, it's, it's kind of tiny um, and it does struggle particularly in um, in wet conditions if you're going too fast and you go around a the corner then the nose wheel will just lose traction so you have to be very careful when you're taxing it in terms of keeping an eye on the speed and everything just feels slow when you're flying it because you're high up so when you take off remember the first time I took off somebody called rotate to uh, to get the aircraft airborne and I thought no you've got to be kidding you know we're, we're barely moving here along the runway because you sat so high up you don't have re any real feeling of speed um, and the same in the flare as well. You, you, you flare and you've really got to just look down the far end of the runway and you flare. And the thing you really notice, I remember first time we touched down, is that the aircraft actually touches down miles behind you. It, it's a very strange sensation um, for when you're at the flight deck. So it's, um, it's not like any other aircraft in that sense. It's, it's really an amazing piece of kit um, and uh, just you, we, what a pleasure to have, to have flown it. So that's the general, the, uh, the aircraft and a few bits about the uh, the dimensions of it. New York, where I've already said New York obviously is a massive part in the uh, 74 history for British Airways. So I thought I'd just mention a couple of bits about it. Um, at its peak, we were flying up to 10 flights a day to New York. And New York is a very interesting uh, airfield for anyone that's um, operated there from the pilots in the audience. Um, it's got a lot of runways. Um, and when you're given an approach there, they, they tend to, to change the runway you're gonna land on quite a lot. Um, and there's one approach here, the uh, Kanazi approach, which is very interesting. As you can see the, the track across the ground there um, that you fly, it's, it is almost like the old Hong Kong approach. Um, and it's, I said one through left there, it's one through left or right. You can actually tighten the turn and land on the, uh, the, uh, the right-hand runway of those two. That's showing the left-hand runway. So the thing I wanted to show here was, um, Old style, we used to come down what was just a, a, a non-precision approach down to a point, and then you'd follow a running rabbit of, of lights, which just sort of ran past the, um, uh, onto the, led you into the, to the runway, which was, um, it was, it was fantastic, and, uh, but a difficult approach, and, and obviously they fly this in all sorts of weathers. It's basically a noise um, sensitive approach, so um, quite tricky. And as you can see, the different lines on the left hand picture are all the ground tracks that different aircraft are flown trying to, to line up with the runway. The, the sort of overly dot, the green dot on the top there, is, is actually a racetrack, like a proper horses racetrack type thing. And, and you're not allowed to go over the top of that uh, at, at all costs. If you upset the horses, you're in big, big trouble. Um, so I spoke earlier about the fact that we spent a lot of money on the aircraft and we updated the navigation databases, et cetera. And um, we brought in a new approach that we could fly through the database, which allowed pretty much, as you can see on the bottom, um, there, that's a number of flights overlaid over the top of each other. Absolute pinpoint accuracy to get down to the runway on this approach, which was, um, as I say, a very, very tricky approach uh, at the best of times. Uh, uh, but this just made it so, so much better. And that's 
the the sort of development of the 74 fleet but it has incredible history with with new york and and i know everyone here in new york will be um sadly missing the aircraft um as it's not coming anymore so I was asked if I could talk about a few um, highlights um, through my flying of the 747 and I sort of scratched my head and I thought, what can I, uh, what can I talk about? So the first one I thought I'd mention was, uh, was um, flying into Kai Tak. Now, subsequent to uh, this, I found out that um, Hugh is actually a, uh, a Kai Tak expert, having been out in Hong Kong. Um, I think Hugh's been around this approach more times than I've been around the M25. So I'm a little bit humbled to, uh, to be talking about it, having only been around it once. Um, but it made such a big impression on me, I thought I would mention it. It was my third ever landing on the jumbo, which is quite incredible, really. I mean, I look back on it now and I take my hat off to the training captain who had clearly the confidence in me or whatever it was, I, I don't know. Um, but he decided, yeah, of course you can land it, which was brilliant because I say I'd only done two landings before. Um, and it's a, I put the approach chart on there and um, just to show you that you kind of came over the top and then it was quite a, a tricky approach all the way around. And then you can see that final turn onto the onto the finals from there. So it was like a precision approach down to the famous checkerboard. Those of you who have heard of the checkerboard and I've got it on the picture there. Um, and then you do this turn that everyone's, you know, I think we'll remember over the top of the houses and they're lining up to land and, and very little time from doing the turn to actually landing. And we used to do a, um, a complete simulated detail training on the conversion course, four hours going around this, this approach in different weather conditions just to prepare you. And, and I was hugely fortunate that I actually got to fly it. And I remember this was way back before, you know, any of the, the, the sad events in, in the States and the, the lock flight deck door. And, and I remember there was glancing around and I think there was probably a few more faces on the flight deck than I expected watching us come around this approach absolutely amazing so and the other thing I remember about it was coming around the corner I firstly amazing myself that I was actually in a position to land and we managed to land off the approach which was which was wonderful and then taxiing off and noticing I was actually physically shaking which is uh, unbelievable I mean and what it dawned on me was just the adrenaline of flying this this fabulous airplane around the corner in Kai Tak and landing it and and you know i've done some pretty amazing flying in my time you know i've been very very fortunate throughout time but this was just such a buzz I, and, and i was literally shaking from the adrenaline as we taxi it off and taxi it back in it was just an incredible thing to do and, and what an immense privilege to have to have done that so hugh i take my hat off to you having pinged around there um like i say like i go around the m25 so uh, amazing amazing approach and hats off to anyone who's flown that approach the next um, thing I thought I'd mention as well, there's the um, 2016 was bringing the um, Paralympics GB team back from Rio. Now, you probably remember there was huge, <coughs> excuse me, huge sort of Olympic and Paralympic fever back around then, really from 2012 and 2016. And I was just so privileged to have been able to fly the team back from Rio. Um, I've got a sort of small connection. I, I'm involved with a charity called Airability. If you Google them, they're an amazing charity. They, well, we get uh, lots of support for uh, anyone with all sorts of disabilities and get them flying. So I was absolutely privileged to go and pick up and fly home the, uh, the Paralympics um, team, which was, it was just an amazing experience. Now, the, the, the most amazing thing about doing these flights is that um, you have a lot to think about, um, not just um, logistically about the flight itself, which is, is tricky enough, you know, with that many and disabled um, passengers on board, but just the whole piece of, of everything that goes along with it. Um, as you can see there, that's um, that's Dame Sarah's story and uh, Kadena Cox, two of the athletes, pretty well known. And um, they, well, as you can see, they did quite well, really. It was, uh, it was quite a successful um, Paralympics for us. And there are lots of jokes about takeoff weight and being able to calculate it with all this extra metal on board with all these medals, which was which was fantastic. But the wonderful thing was we wanted to do the very, very best for, for the team when they were coming back. So um, we had them in the flight deck, we had press around, we had all sorts. But the, the problem with all of that is you, you have to actually fly the airplane safely. So um, a big part of that is having some really good people with you um, and knowing when to say, right, that's it. Everybody's got to go now and we've got to fly this aircraft back. So lots of pressure on the flight back in terms of a Rio. I mean, clearly um, all these different um, countries are picking up their, uh, their team. So the airport was immensely busy. It's busy anyway, Rio. Um, and then the flight plan I put on the side there, just if you can look in the middle of the flight, there's a great sort of um, sorcery shaped thing. And that was a great big storm struck right in the middle of the route, which was interesting as well. So and also there was huge pressure to get back because 
Uh, I don't know if you recall it at the time, but there was massive press coverage of the arrival back in the into the um, into the UK. So a bit of pressure there as well. So the the, the thing was, I thought, I did, we don't be late, Al. Was the general comment? You know, uh, you know, I do my best most days, but this was Al. Really, please don't be late. There's going to be a lot of press coverage here. So we we chucked, we put some extra fuel on the aircraft. I won't say how much. Um, and we reckoned we could make up 20, 25 minutes on the way back if we really went for it. And that's again the magnificent 747. It can it can cut a turn of speed when it needs to. But luckily we managed to get away on time and come back to the UK. And then the huge pressure, you, you wouldn't believe it, it doesn't matter how experienced you are flying, um, you know, the pressure to land this thing in in uh, in a, a great way, because I knew it was going to be filmed and with all these incredible athletes on board was amazing. But we managed to get away with it and then taxied in and there were literally were people everywhere. It was unbelievable. Fire trucks, everything, air traffic congratulating the team. I mean, it just was immense. And they're pulling onto stand just wall to wall cameras, people everywhere. I mean, what an absolute privilege and, and, and you know, hugely emotional thing for me to do. And um, and the real emotional part of all that, which I should have mentioned really was I did my I wrote kind of a little speech like a welcome on board, um, not just the usual sort of welcome on board and, and be safe, everybody. But I put a little thing together about they were back, you know, and the 7-4 to me always, if you see it at an airport down route, it's a little bit of Great Britain and I'd welcome them back on board Great Britain and how proud the country was because they've been a little bit closed away in Rio. And, and you know, I, I, I struggled to get through it because it was so emotional. Absolutely. What a what an amazing thing to do. So, yeah, very lucky to have, to have flown that flight. And thank goodness everything went fine. And we, we brought these wonderful athletes home. So the last one I'll, I'll mention in terms of highlights uh, before we get on to the final flight is, is this. You, you may not have heard of this if you're not a football fan. Um, and, I, and I'm sort of a medium football fan, as, as, as I would say. Um, so this is the FIFA Club World Cup. So this is all the football teams in the world. Um, they do actually have a, their own Club World Cup. So the winners of the various trophies around the world uh, take part in this. And we were very fortunate to be able to pick up the, um, the flight to bring uh, a very well-known Spanish team. Well, I might as well tell you, Real Madrid, there aren't too many of them, um, back from this, this um, tournament back to the UK. So we flew from Haneda in Japan back to the UK, um, which which was great. And, and the theory of it, I said, yeah, that's brilliant. You know, you think Japan to Madrid, that's just got to be the same as Japan to London, isn't it? If you look on a map, you know, it was sort of the same distance, really. Um, but not really, because when you fly back from Japan to, to Madrid, you go pretty much the same routine as you do to London. So you go up over Siberia, then down through Scandinavia, and then past London for another hour and 50 minutes, nearly two hours. So this is actually an enormous flight. It was about nearly a 14 hour flight to bring the, the team home, which was fine. But the only problem for any of you that have operated out of Haneda in Japan, Tokyo airport, is very, very, very noise sensitive. Um, and so uh, as the evening goes on, they gradually close more runways, um, particularly the noise sensitive ones. And, and all those runways they seem to close seem to get shorter and shorter and shorter. So your actual performance to get out of there is, is very difficult um, in terms of if you don't have the right runway available. Now, it was all going all going well um, up to the point I left the hotel. I thought, well, I'll watch the match because I should know who some of the players are. So I watched the match. And unfortunately, when I left, it was about... I don't know, not long to go. And Real Madrid were losing 2-0. So I thought, oh, well, here we go. It's not going to be, you know, a whoop whoop fly on the way home. You know, they're going to be a little bit upset because they've been you know, losing 2-0. So I left, went off to the airport. And then when we got to the airport, we found out that they'd actually managed to score, that clever chap, Cristiano Ronaldo, two goals in the last couple of minutes. And they'd gone into extra time, which were, for a Real fan is fantastic. For Al, thinking this airport is shutting around me, was not so great. So we were sat there on this aeroplane um, and they're still in the stadium playing football. It's like, oh, you know, these runways are closing. We're not going to get out of here. It's just a disaster. But I mean, luckily they managed to win after an extra 30 minutes and they got brought to the airport very quickly and they were whisked through and we closed the aircraft up, taxied out and managed with a little bit of favourable wind to sneak our way out of Anita. And, uh, and you know, you think, oh, thank goodness for that. And off we went back. 14 hours or whatever it was down to to uh, Madrid to a beautiful uh, forecast in Madrid, which, of course, there's always a sting in the tail. So we get to Madrid and you get the weather and it, and it was an absolute stonking crosswind, huge crosswind, which is it's a little bit of handful on the 747. It's got very big wings, as you know, um, and they're very lively on the ground. You're still flying the aircraft when you're on the ground. So 
um, that was wonderful. They, they, the relief captain was was delighted. Um, he was winding me up and, and leant over as we came sort of through a thousand feet, wishing me good luck, which I thought was very kind of him. Um, but obviously, when you have a, a you know a landing like that, those of you that fly know it, it kind of concentrates the mind really. And um, and we got away with it, and it was a nice landing. So that was an absolute result. But again, another highlight of my career to uh, to meet and to bring uh, some very successful uh, football players back, which was terrific. So that brings me on to the um, the last flight. And again, um, what a privilege to fly this. I mean, I, I absolutely just happened to be in the right place. Um, I would love to have flown the aircraft for a few more years, but we really thought, you know, if it's going to go now, we're going to give it the send off it deserves um, because it really the, the fabulous history that we've seen. This aircraft deserves not just to be popped, popped away and nobody noticed. So our press office team at um, British Airways were I have to say magnificent um, and and really, really went for it. And when they told me the plans they had, I, I, I must admit, I did swallow initially and think, crikey, maybe, maybe we have overdone this a little bit um, because it was amazing. We had um, we had all sorts of uh, interviews, different channels, Sky, BBC, all sorts wanting to to come and interview us. And they had a, a helicopter up um, doing live filming um which was which was wonderful so we were going to get this a, a magnificent um send off the initial plan was to fly the two aircraft and take off together which was um i must admit i was a tiny bit skeptical about that um we we practiced how we were going to go three two one doof, and put the power on together but of course everyone wants to be the last person to lift off out of Heathrow. so i had this, this sort of worrying thing that we you know we were going to be out oh, there well, is he is he airborne yet sort of thing and um so that was the initial plan but those of you who managed to see it on the day um the weather did intervene so we needed a 2000 foot cloud base to do this this wonderful joint takeoff um and we sat there and it was about i must admit it was about 1800 feet something like that and i thought oh do you know what might get away with it um but uh, as you saw if you saw it on the tv that the weather took the decision away from me which was in a way uh, a little bit easier um and uh, i was worried about the fly through actually because we needed to, we were down at 500 feet for that but so the weather wasn't terrific um it did get sort of bad as we departed it was almost like the great british weather uh, and uh, shedding a tear for the beautiful queen of the skies as she left heathrow for the last time so um so yeah so we couldn't do this pairs takeoff but we um we ended up uh, i thought well, well if we're not going to go pairs we'll go one behind the other as quickly as we can so um i did I think in the back of my mind, if I can tuck the aircraft right up, someone somewhere is bound to get a picture of the two of them nose to nose, um, which I think we've got on the next slide. So um, managed to tuck it up in the top left corner there. Um, and then we took literally one went and then I lined up straight away and went off straight behind. And then we um, vectored back round uh, straight away for this fly through. And one thing I should say before uh, I talk about the fly through is that, that it was also quite logistically tricky on the day because the weather wasn't great and it also it was like a front coming through the UK and the other aircraft, the, the, the beautiful Nagus aircraft there, was going to um, Gloucester, to Kemble Aerodrome and that is a visual aerodrome. It, literally, you've got to, you've got to have a, a high cloud base and be able to see where you're going and the weather forecast was terrible. Um, now, the press team were magnificent, but the ops team were a little bit more keen in being operational and wanting to deliver both the aircraft. So they very much said, um, if one of you goes, you go in. And I, I was a little bit skeptical about that. I thought, well, it's a little bit tricky. You know, we can't have one depart on the final day with all the news media. Um, I, I did say to them, actually, what are you planning on tucking the other one around behind the hangar and hoping nobody notices? Um, so it was it was uh, a little bit a little bit worrying. Um, but actually, the the front came through quickly enough, and we did actually manage to get them both through. Those of you that saw on the day, the uh, the Kemble aircraft did a, I think it held for uh, 20 minutes or so, and then was managed to get in. So um, so that's that top. Uh, left hand picture the middle picture is our fly through again 500 feet i don't think there's many people that have had the chance to fly through heathrow at 500 feet um and we thought about 500 feet and how what that would look like and we thought well if we can't go really low we'll go pretty slow so then it was a conversation around what flap do we use and, and we used we thought flap 10 which is a sort of mid-range flap on the jumbo would look better for photos than flap 20 which is quite a lot of flap um so we were back at a sort of 150 odd knots which is pretty slow if anyone was there we sort of we thought well you know what we're going to give it a a, a good send off um 
And uh, yeah, it was, the weather wasn't great, but we managed to do a, a reasonable job of flying down the runway just so everyone could see this, this beautiful aircraft for the last time. And off we went to St. Athens. And there we are, top uh, right uh, landing in St. Athens. Um, now, a few people said to me, you know, was it really emotional? How was the landing and everything? And I must admit that the emotional bit for me was, and it, did, and it didn't hit me at all. I was really busy. We were doing interviews, we were doing all sorts of stuff. And, and then off we went, and which was busy with the weather and everything. It really hit me when we rotated on, on takeoff. You know, the, the, the actual emotional moment of, of sort of pulling back on the runway in a 7-4 at Heathrow, British Airways, for the last time really kind of struck me, really. And that, that was an amazing moment. Um, and then we were fairly busy and then we landed, which was fine. And then the other moment that really struck me is when you shut it down. Yeah, if you ever shut an aircraft down, if you've ever delivered one for the last time, it, it's a hugely emotional moment because to me, the power drops off and it really feels like a life support machine you've just switched off. A beautiful, beautiful aircraft that's perfectly capable of flying and you know it's not going to fly again. So that was our fly through and our St. Athens arrival. And then just in the bottom corner there, that's the lovely BOAC aircraft when it did its final flight down to um, St. Athens as well. So that was a hugely emotional um, day. Absolutely privileged to have done it. Um, we did try to give as much coverage to the aircraft as we could. If anyone's connected with me on LinkedIn, um, you can see I was posting all the way through uh, that period. If you want to connect with me and see those posts, then please feel free to do that. Um, and you can see lots of little videos and other things we did too. Um, I hope we gave the, the beautiful aircraft the send off that she really deserved. So yeah, really, really emotional. Um, so that was the um, the farewell to the Queen of the Skies. It was my pleasure. I hope that was that was interesting for you. Oh, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. And I think I can say probably on behalf of almost every listener here, um, it certainly had my fingers, uh, my hairs on the uh, ends of my arms standing up just watching it so thank you. Uh, so that brings us now on to the next part of our afternoon which is the panel discussion so hopefully you will now be joining us as well we've got a couple of questions to run through. Uh, the first one then I suppose starts right at the beginning of your career on the 747 so why did you initially choose to fly the 747? Hugh if, uh, if you'd like to go first. Well in fact uh... So I've said it, I wasn't actually, I didn't choose it, I was put on it, which, for which I was very grateful. Uh, the 747 was the first aircraft to use the National Navigation System, which as hadn't been trialled for any length of time. It was the same system that took the Apollo project to the moon. And BOAC wanted a Czech navigator on the aeroplane in case the INS didn't work and we had excellent months on the first three aeroplanes so if for some reason the INS uh, proved not to be reliable we would have to go back to straight navigation. We soon realized of course that the INS worked perfectly well and the engines didn't so uh, my job as a Czech navigator was very short-lived and I became a, an instructor like uh, Al Bridger was in the 747 I became a, a TRI and TRE on the 747 simulator where we did training for all pilots all up to captains but we could only check first officers for their licenses. So even though you didn't necessarily get to choose to be on the uh, 747 you certainly grew to love it. Oh yes I certainly actually it I was extremely grateful of course for going on it because it was a total change from the 70. I mean the 70 autopilot was just you had uh, pitch hold and heading hold and altitude hold, that was it. The 747 of course had a totally uh, but one more advanced or analog uh, uh, autopilot system where you could obviously fly speeds and stuff and it also it was uh, Cat 3 qualified. BOAC and I think KLM were the only two aeroplanes that decided to go to Cat 3 so we had three autopilots and the idea was that all landings back at London should be in auto land to get Cat 3 certification. And uh, first officers, of course, could fly the airplane in all modes. So the first officers were doing auto lands. And most captains probably didn't want to bother with auto land so much. So we did most of our auto lands back at Heathrow. And we actually had Cat 2 
clearance after one year and Cat 3 clearance after two years, which was much quicker than before, because of course the aeroplane came from Boeing with the autopilot already uh, fixed in many ways. Fantastic. And uh, Al, what about you? What made you bid to choose uh, the 747? I was um, I was very fortunate because when I joined British Airways, um, they were taking on a lot of pilots at the time and uh, they were taking them on for all sorts of different aircraft. Um, I'd flown the 757, so I was I was ideally placed to fly uh, either you know one of the, the long haul aircraft. And um, I absolutely wanted to fly the 747. So, you know, my decision was I really want to fly it. Um, I'd rejoin British Airways anyway, but but when they asked, and they did ask at the time, what would you like to fly? What fleet? Um, it was a no brainer for me. It was no, I, I really would like to be um, on the 747 because it's, you know, you've seen the history of it and it's British Airways and it's like, the, the the best really as far as I was concerned and 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 they rang me up and said Al do you, do you fancy joining us and, and by the way do you want to fly the seven port I'm like whoa, whoa, really um, you know how long do I have to think about that oh yes um, so that was a kind of very very fortunate so I did have a little bit of a say in it um, but it was uh, just happened that they needed people and and boy uh, was I lucky absolutely right place right time fantastic. Absolutely. You can say it best yourself, right place, right time. And it is very much about timing in this industry. So what an opportunity to have. Um, so the next thing really that we're so fortunate to have today is three generations, I suppose, of BA pilots sitting all together. And one of the things that we really get the opportunity to do is to chat to our colleagues and gather all the experience other people have given us. So what piece of advice, what was the best piece of advice that a senior pilot gave you during your careers? Al, we'll start with you. Yeah, that's a, what a great question. Uh, really great question. I, and of course, uh, senior pilots are, are full of wonderful advice. Absolutely, they are. And uh, and I've been very fortunate to to have the advice of many um, over the years. And I, and I guess it, it, the advice flying wise is the same as anything, really. You know, flying is a real head game, like most things are. Um, so you need to be confident in what you're doing. And, and the best trainers and the best managers that have given me advice anywhere, I've, I've always just said, you know, just whatever you do, just do your best. Um, you know, and, and that will be good enough. If it isn't good enough, it's not because you haven't tried and you haven't done your best. So, um, you know, that has helped me over time um, because, you know, we're, we're all pilots. We've all had long careers. We've all we've all had those moments of oh that. And it's normally a, land, a landing or something or, or on or, or the course and it's getting difficult. And it's like, well, you know what? If you've given it 110 um, percent, that's all you can do. And if that's enough and you're very lucky, then that's wonderful. But you just yeah, do your best and absolutely enjoy it because it's a privilege to do. Oh, absolutely. This can be the job, best job in the world sometimes. It really can. We're very lucky to have the opportunities and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Hugh, what about yourself? What was the uh, best piece of advice you were given? Well, I would say almost just by example, because my boss for years was uh, Captain Phil Brentel, who was, oh, uh, did 30 legs to raids in the, in the war. Then he was on the Comet One and he was the first or the first training manager on 707 and the he was my training manager on 70s and then he was the training manager 747 and of course he gave my job but if you flew with Phil I mean he flew the airplanes absolutely immaculately and, and that's uh, obviously a given and he required people to be at, at the right standard if you weren't the right standard it wasn't a big deal you, you just weren't there anymore shall we say but Phil what I admired about Phil was his tolerance and his, the way he treated other people and uh, his sort of crew management, if I can put it that way. The other person actually adding on a bit was Jimmy Andrew, who was the general manager of flight technical services for BOAC at the time. And on his desk, he had a little note saying, unless we forget, our job is to carry a maximum payload at a minimum cost. Because of course, our job in a commercial airline is to stay in business. And he thought that that took care of everything, including safety, uh, 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 passenger service, because obviously if you weren't safe, if you didn't look after passengers, you wouldn't carry many passengers. And, uh, and again, of course, the operational aspects where you had uh, to minimise the fuel uplift, get maximum payload and fly the aeroplane efficiently. So maybe that was more by example rather than straight advice. 
Yeah, so I, I suppose the more the advice you get, and particularly if you can look up to someone in the industry, then it really is so important. Um, ever since I started flying, I always remember people saying that it all goes so quickly. Um, I'm almost at five years of flying now, and it feels like I came out of flight school yesterday. So I can't believe it, but I'm so grateful and so lucky to be here. And I think it is just about making the most of your time while you have it. So Nick, you've both been flight manager technical at, on the 747 at different times. So what impressed you technically about the 747? Uh, Hugh, we'll start with you first. Well, I think uh, having four hydraulic systems, I mean, this, the 707 we came from was a good brute force aeroplane and you may or may not know that it, it did have boosted um, rudder and, uh, aileron, uh, and uh, spoilers for directional control, but you could fly the aeroplane without hydraulics. Uh, it was all done by a uh, suitable system of levers and uh, servo tabs. Uh, then going to the 74, of course, it was the first aircraft we flew, which was all hydraulic, and it was very reassuring to have four hydraulic system off the four engines, I would say, is one thing that hit me to begin with. Fantastic. Uh, and yourself, Al, I mean, you've seen uh, obviously the latter half of it. What's impressed you technically? I, I, well, I'd echo what Hugh said there, you know, the redundancy on the aircraft is incredible. Um, and so technically, I mean, pretty much, I am slightly biased, but I think technically pretty much everything is on it. You really struggle to find anything that's not right with this aircraft. And I came off the 7.5 originally onto it. And the thing that was, and it's just a tiny thing, but but it was a uh, thing that amazed me was this wonderful auto start system um, where you just literally pull, pull the uh, one switch, flick the uh, fuel control over and... Um, and the engine starts itself and, and looks after itself. It's incredible. And I was like, first time I saw it, I was like, Whoa, hey, this is just amazing. And you can do two at a time. Um, what a great bit of kit. I mean, it just is, it, yeah, they, you, you really do struggle to find anything that's, that's not technically brilliant on the aeroplane. I would have to say, of course, that was very, very different on the early aeroplanes where we had to struggle to get any of the engines started. And you <laughs> had to turn the aeroplane into wind to get the fans turning the right way. Uh, to get the engine to start and occasionally in Darwin you know when it was a flat car we'd actually if we managed to get three engines started you'd taxi very slowly down the runway to get the last one started so interesting time on the early aeroplanes it's, it's all about the timing all about the timing Hugh and, uh, indeed so the other thing as well with, with, with us was where, when you got them going they generally stayed going um, which I know was not quite so true on the on the early aircraft no, it was, a, it was good uh, engine out handling practice on the airplane for real. Yes. Yeah, it's wonderful to see as well how for one aircraft type, there are so many different parts that impressed you because you've seen the full development really all the way from the start through to the end. And if it keeps impressing for many generations, it's, it must be really quite an aircraft. So in that sense, what did it actually teach you about flying? What did you learn about flying an airplane in general from the 747. Uh, Al, we'll come to you first. I guess, uh, that, I mean, that, again, that's an excellent question. It really is. And, and what did I learn about flying, just per se flying, um, flying a 747? And I think the thing that hit me really is that the, the actual, the airplane flies magnificently. I mean, it's a beautiful airplane. For the size of it, it, it handles really, really well. It's a little bit pitchy, but it's, but it's very nice. And the amazing thing is that it is like any aircraft. So anyone who's privileged enough to be a pilot uh, and whatever you fly, the, the the up, down, left, right bit, whether you're flying a 747 or whatever you're flying is is exactly the same. And and that kind of amazed me. You know, you see this 74 and it's it's a thing of legend, myth and legend. And, and you get to fly and you think, this is just amazing. It just flies beautifully like any other aircraft. You know, it's got wings and engines. It goes up, down, left, right. And it's just, I guess that's the, the main thing for me, really. Thank you. Well, I would say exactly the same. It was a airplane which uh, was ex handled extremely well. It was beautifully stable on the approach. I remember uh, flying with an ex uh, Lockheed pilot on the 747 and he does com uh, commend the 747 for being beautifully stable on the approach, but also extremely maneuverable. And I think as mentioned elsewhere that uh, you know, the question and answer is that it's now being used to launch satellites for 35,000 feet. Notice they bank hard right and then release their, their uh, rocket to send the satellites into space. So a remarkably versatile airplane. Absolutely. There are so many uses for them. There really are. 
Uh, which brings me on to my next question. Now, Al, you've told us about Paralympics, you've told us about football World Cups, but you've gone through many approaches, last flights. So I was going to ask you about your most interesting flight, but uh, I wonder if I'll come to Hugh first so I can give you a second or two to possibly conjure up one of the many other examples I'm sure you have. Uh, so Hugh, I think you have a, a couple of interesting experiences that I'd love to hear about. Well, on the 74, uh, yes, very, very few people have engine fires on the airplane, if you'd like me to talk about that one, uh, Ellie. Yeah. Uh, we were taking off from Perth. This was in 1983 or 84. I would have to say, that Don Mitchell was flying the airplane. It was the first stop of his sector. So Don uh, just uh, called for the gear up and I, re I reached across to pick the gear up and the fire warning went off. We did have a smell of burning and uh, at about 200 feet, Don just uh, called for the engine fire checklist on number one engine, which uh, myself and the flight engineer, Keith Govey, we shut it down and fired off both bottles Fire warning lights stayed on. So we then went through the checklist and wound it up to 280 knots, try and blow it out. And still the fire warning lights was on. And I remember looking out of the window and saying to Don, well, I can't see anything. It was a pitch black night. And so obviously we, we asked the CSD to come up, who was probably the vintage of old um, uh, George Oldfield. Or, and uh, he said, yes, so there was some flames on that engine and it stopped now. The spell of burning had gone. So I then remember saying to Don, what do you want to do, Don? Go on a Bombay on three engines? So he said, no, dump fuel, go back to Perth. So I said, good decision, and that's what we did. And as I say, the fire warning light never went out. It actually went out when they changed the engine uh, or disconnected the system. Uh, and I, later on in my time at, uh, at Airbus, I use this as an example that the later uh, electronic systems which tell the crew what to do are limited by the inputs uh, because if it was an ECAM on a TriStar or, or sorry on, on an Airbus at the time it would tell you to uh, land back immediately overweight and evacuate on the runway and if we'd done that of course we'd uh, probably blown the fusible plugs because we were way overweight and all the tires had gone flat so we would have blocked the airport for for hours. Um, only one person suggested from the UK CAA that we should have gone back because the fire loading light was on. I said, ah, oh, well, we used our extra sense of smell and the sense of burning had gone out. So that confirmed to us that the engine had gone out and therefore it was safe to go, to go back. So that was my sort of first little uh, probably I most interesting flight I guess. Yes I particularly like the, uh, the the newspaper article to the right there Captain Cool's Danger Days. <laughs> as far as uh, headlines go that's a very exciting one to have I quite liked that one Hugh. <laughs> well, all right yes thank you. And there's a story I believe as well that um, we were going to have a bit of a look at as well. Oh that was uh, what uh, happened on the classic 747? Of course, the initial ones came up in just with the, the basic autopilot. There was no cruise auto thrust, uh, which later aircraft had. And the flight engineer was having to control the, the speed by, the, by manually adjusting the throttles. And it was fine, it, which meant to say you had to probably fly faster than the airplane was his, its best speed because it was unstable at 0.83, which was actually the best speed for economy. Uh, and rather than fitting the cruise autothrust, which later 747 classics had, uh, Honeywell persuaded BA to fit the 757-767 flight management system, which was a massive uh, engineering uh, endeavor. And uh, there were the, the odd little occasions where things went didn't go quite right. And it's so coincidentally, I happened to be on this flight from New York to London and we were about 20 West coming in. I was actually flying, it was my sector, so I was quite flying the airplane and I'd actually looked down to pick up a file which I had, which was full of FMS uh, uh, documentation 
because we were still developing it. In fact, I always said to Honeywell that you had 750 development crew members helping you develop the system. And uh, while I was looking down, old Roger Greaves, who was the, in fact, the co-pilot with uh, well, Eric Moody's when they uh, lost all the engines, old Roger disconnected the autopilot. So I, I looked down and said, what are you doing there, Roger? He said, well, it's going downhill. And what had happened, it just suddenly very smoothly pitched over because I didn't feel it. And then, of course, the interesting thing was we got back to, to Heathrow and obviously we put in an initial report and everything and re reported it to the aviation engineers. In fact, the interesting thing about the, the whole principle of actually BOAC, everybody was one one building. So the aviation en engineers were just above us in the floor above. So. Uh, I asked them what had gone on. Initially, they said, oh, nothing to do with the FMS. It was due to the autopilot. There were some autopilot problems. When I spoke to the autopilot engineers, they said, well, yeah, there were a few, but if you run any tests on the autopilot, you're going to find problems. Finally, the FMS people, who obviously were very protective about their system, admitted that it was caused by a bit flip on the altitude bus. So when we were flying along, suddenly the FMS thought it was at 100,000 feet, and it started to pitch down to take us down to 33,000 feet. So that was an, an interesting period. As I said, it highlighted the, the interesting period there was when we developed this FMS system, which in the end worked very well, but it took a bit of time to settle down. How interesting. Gosh, it must have been a, quite an excitement for the day. Al, oh, was there anything you wanted to add? I feel like we've covered quite a few exciting things. Yeah. I, I guess the only other one, I, I, I've, I've never um, been Captain Cool like uh, Hugh there um, and had fires and things, so I, I'm a bit humbled by that. But um, the only other one I was going to mention is we used a fifth engine pod, engines around. Have you ever, if you can Google it and see, they used to tuck it on the inboard of the inside engine. And we've, we had a, an aircraft down in um, Harare that, that had a, uh, an engine problem. Um, and we ended up flying down to Joburg and then bringing back the spare engine when they put the new engine on. And it sits just inside. Um, as I say, the inboard pod, but actually it restricts your speed again. So you, you're back at sort of 0.78, um, which in the 74 is pretty slow. And from from Joburg, that's quite a um, quite a long flight time, you know, a long way. And 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 you do notice as well that they just whilst they've done a fabulous job of it, it's blanked off and it and it does vibrate the aircraft a little bit. So, but the most amazing thing is when you do the walk round and you're there and there's just there just seems to be whichever engine is bolted on or whatever wing it's bolted on, it's, it, it's just engines everywhere. It's quite an amazing thing to do. So nothing as cool as you, but uh, I thought I'd uh, roll that one in. Yeah, it must be quite surprising when you do a walk around and there are suddenly five engines on the aircraft. It nothing. looks really weird. I, I bet it does, I bet it does. Um, well, we've got some questions from the audience. Um, we've got a little bit of time to go through them. I'm counting 47 at the moment uh, and it's still increasing. So we'll try and get through as many of them as we can, but apologies if your question doesn't get read out, but please do keep sending them through. Uh, so the first one here is from Hugh Thompson. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, what plans are there for the simulators? Um, are they going to be offering flights like the Concorde ones at Brooklands? Oh, or anyone who's uh, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. So we've got three sims um, uh, that, we, that we left at the end. We originally had four. Um, so of those three, they um, they were pretty much up for sale, really. Um, obviously, we didn't need them anymore. So one of them's gone to a, another airline already. And then there's two others there, uh, which if anyone wants to uh, give us a call and buy one, then um, let us know. So, um, yeah, we will be decommissioning them. We, we, we don't actually have a, a, you know, a need to, to run them. Um, uh, they're still operational at the moment, but um, yeah, please um, give us a shout and you can come and buy one. I don't think it'll fit in my front room, sadly, but uh, <laughs> it's worth the thought. Back garden? Uh, maybe I'd push. <laughs> um, and going along the same sort of lines, we've had a question here from Steve asking what's happening to all the spares and tools, considering that a lot of the operators are also retiring their aircraft. Do you know what's happening to any of those? Uh, I don't, I'd have to ask engineering. I don't know. I mean, I, I assume that uh, and I don't know whether any of the tools are um, uh, generic tools that you can use in other aircraft. But I mean, the, um, I assume that we would be um, selling off inventory um, if, if that were the case, because there is, there, you know, the market's not huge, um, but, I, uh, you know, we don't need them anymore. Then, then I'm sure that's what we would be doing. And bizarrely, we, we, we sold off a load of plates and, uh, and all sorts of crockery and things recently. And, and it was 
amazing. I think it sold out in about 15 minutes. It was incredible. So um, maybe we should do the same thing with tools. <laughs> I can imagine. It'd be quite a laugh. Uh, so we've got a couple of similar questions now, a lot of favourites. So uh, some quick fire questions, hopefully. Uh, the first one being, which of your, which of the seven sevens, uh, seven four sevens, were your favourite type, both sort of generally and also individual registrations, if you have any? Hugh, we'll start with you. Well, of course, I started off on the early ones, as you say, with the dash three engines, which is difficult to start the engines. Um, so, I mean, it was a a, a great favourite just to get on this aeroplane because it was such a massive difference from the from the 707. So one accepted all these uh, little idiosyncrasies of the initial aeroplane that almost made it more interesting and more of a challenge. Um, but I then, well, after after BA, if you're talking about the 747, my other flying, I, I flew the 747 SP uh, with Rolls Royce engines where you could go from uh, almost at max takeover, not quite at max takeover, you go straight up to 45,000 feet. So that was an interesting aeroplane to fly, and that was uh, an aeroplane which had the same front end, if that same cockpit as Air Force One. It wasn't a fully, it, it was a sort of semi plastic aeroplane, but not uh, as advanced as the 747 400. I know friends of mine who flew the classic and the 747 400. Uh, much preferred the 747-400 because of the automatic sound and of course the superb extra power you had from the Rolls-Royce engines. Lovely and Al, you particularly, we've had a particular request for which of yours was your individual favourite aircraft? Yeah, I mean I only, I only flew the 400 so um, so I can only say the 400 um, was magnificent. I think if you, if you think about um, the liveried aircraft at the end and I'm so so pleased we did that, we, we did those um, those retro liveries, there were the three of them. Um, the, the sad part was being that the, uh, the, the, the one of them actually I joined on in 97, so it was a retro livery that I joined on, which made didn't make me feel great, but um, of the three of the uh, retro aircraft, the, uh, the BOAC one, I, I was there when it was delivered um, back from the paint shops, and I knew, you know what BOAC livery looks like, don't you? Think? Yeah, I know what this thing looks like, but actually it, it landed, it taxied in, and my jaw was on the floor. I mean, it just was, beautiful i mean unbelievable the blue and the gold um what a great livery now obviously when you're sat inside it you don't really notice what it looks like on the outside but but what a great great aircraft and and the very fitting that that was the last one that did a, a flight for us so yeah that's my my personal favorite yeah absolutely i think the uh, the liveries at the end were wonderful i, I personally love the landor but all of them were such a it was such a nice touch especially to finish their careers on uh, so the last of the favorites questions is slightly different and that was which of the passenger seats was your favourite to sit on? So I'm going to take it as passengers. You can't pick the left hand seat today. Uh, I mean, I personally, I love the upper deck. It was beautiful um, up in club there. It almost felt like your own private aeroplane in the space that they had. Um, but if you had to pick a seat as a passenger, which one would you go for? For, for me, yeah. I mean, uh, to be honest, I've been hugely privileged to have flown in in all the different cabins. I mean, what what a what, what a wonderful thing that is. So, but my personal favourite is 64K or was 64K. So, um, we kept that as a real secret. So, as you came up the up the stairs uh, on the 400 with the straight stairs, came round and it was the first club seat on the right hand side. And the reason for that is because you you went round and the way the screens were, it was very well tucked away, and the upper deck was very curved. So you got lots of width with the seat. So it was like being in your own little private cabin. It was my absolute favourite, 64K. And I can say that now because we're not flying them anymore, but um, I can let that secret go. But yeah, that was my that was my favourite. But all the seats were, were fabulous. And I have to say, with, with us introducing the flatbed seats, what a quantum step forward that was. Um, and an, an amazing uh, thing to do. And the last aircraft were, were just, you know, they were wonderful when they had the cabins refitted. Really wonderful product. Absolutely. I think for BA leading the world and having the flatbed, what a statement that was right at the start of it. And Hugh, what about you? Where, where was your favourite place to sit as a passenger? Well, I, I would have to obviously agree that uh, when the flatbed came along, that was a great advance. But I do remember, uh, I know my friends on Concord would appreciate me saying this, but uh, I was had to pick up an aeroplane, I think on an FMS development flight from New York. and. Mm -hmm. Control center said, oh, you've got to go off tonight. You can either go on a Concorde or 747. And I had a lot of paperwork to do. 
And I thought, well, you know, if I get onto Concord, it's very cramped and I won't be able to spread all my payloads being very untidy all over the place. So I, I went on the 747 and sat in first class, of course, with, with a seat next to me empty and I could spread all my papers all over the place and do about three hours work on the way across, which will upset all my friends on the bionic arrow. But uh, just to say that, you know, I, I enjoyed the first class seats as they were in the first place. Absolutely. Um, no brainer, Hugh, that one. No brainer. Concorde 74, <laughs> don't even have to think about it. <laughs> Well, a, I, I should say a friend of mine who was a commercial Concorde person, you know, he wasn't at BOIC. He said, ah, well, you should have uh, gone on a Concorde and, and then you would have gone to your hotel and, and uh, done your paperwork in the hotel. And I said, well, I wouldn't have done that. I'd have gone out to a pub. <laughs> well, we have a couple of questions coming through from uh, people writing in asking about the 747 versus the Concorde, which uh, is very brave considering it's a 747 webinar, I must admit. <clears throat> um, the next question we have was, what was the one Boeing customer option that you wish BAA did or did not add to the BA at 747? Um, Hugh, we'll start with you. Uh, that's a very good question again. Um, but when you're talking, we had flat beds, as you said, to begin with. I know in the early days, this is probably pre-747, that BOAC, I think, felt were very late in adding passenger, passenger entertainment. But of course, on the early 747s, we had a very crude um, uh, cinema screen and the audio was sort of through um, pneumatic uh, headphones you had, which were a bit basic. Um, trying to think of the customer uh, service. I think in first class we did well, probably in economy. I know that this is probably pre-74. TWA and people probably uh, had a more relaxed attitude to the, the caliber service in the economy, but uh, I'm afraid I'm I'm scratching a bit to think of what what evidently we should have put on. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested in another suggestions. No, that's fine. I don't know if Al's still with us. I think he might have turned himself off for a second. Um, but particularly if there were any uh, any aircraft technical side to that, um, we'll see if we can get Al back for that one. Um, which leads us on to the next question, which I quite enjoyed. Do pilots ever marvel over some of the most amazing views from the cockpit? And that one's from David. Um, and I'm going to start off with this and say absolutely every single time. I certainly don't go to work and not look out the window marvelling every day. It's the best office view in the world and I absolutely love it. I was coming back yesterday um, from Mallorca and coming over Madrid you could see the snow for miles and miles and miles and it's the most snow they've had in 50 years and it was one of the most astonishing views that you could possibly see at the moment um and it was it really touched me and i thought gosh this is amazing just just to see that so hugh do you uh, do you often marvel at the spectacular views from the, the cockpit well i would say absolutely and a, 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 a friend I was talking to, in fact, who is a, uh, he's a, a, a business pilot and he was flying with uh, a colleague who was moaning about particular uh, problems of his lifestyle in his, in, his, in this company. And he, both of them, I think, had previously worked in the city, looking at screens and making money that way. And he said, you don't get a view like this in the city, do you? So. Uh, and the other thing too, absolutely, and in fact, I'm sort of flying up over the northern heights where you fly through, you know, the northern lights actually flying through the effects of uh, the radiation covering of the sun, you know, where that's amazing, I think, too. Of course. Um, and I think we've lost out for the moment. So uh, we'll have one last question before we uh, sadly have to close up and uh, have some closing remarks. Um, and we've got a lovely long question from Baz, who wrote a multitude of questions, but the one that we're particularly looking at is, do you remember landing on runway 23 at Heathrow, um, Hugh? And if so, do you have any particular memories of landing in a 747 and how it was? Apparently it was quite short and could be interesting on a gusty day. So do you have any particular recollections? Well, I'll say two things. Firstly, landing on 23. In fact, I was a bit uh, I, I'm embarrassed when I look back on it. I think this was an early flight, uh, 
the first 747 November Alpha, as you say, the first aircraft had a weak structure in the main section and we had to fly them back. And in fact, my route check was actually flying November Alpha back to Seattle to actually have the structural uh, integrity improved, shall we say, in the center section. And I, I remember flying back to London and I, I was given the sector and we landed on runway 23. And, you know, I had the autopilot engaged and I uh, took it out as we landed on runway 23. Um, and the engineer who met the airplane said, oh, well, how was the auto land? And I said, I'm terribly sorry. I disconnected the autopilot at 200 feet. And I felt, I thought, well, I should have done that. I should have let it do an auto land as part of the development process. Talking about gusty weather, I think the, the biggest gusts I, I, I witnessed, we would, in fact, Terminal 4, and we could actually watch aircraft landing on 2-3, because they was using the crosswind, and uh, you could see the whole airplane, this is on the stand, being vibrating, and we took off on 2-7 two, 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 well, two right, 2-8 two right, and I was flying the airplane, and there was a pretty significant crosswind. I think on, on Peg, I think they said it was 38 knots. And I remember starting off, and of course you put in, we didn't have uh, rudder pedal steering. So you would put in full right rudder, full left aileron, and bumble off down the runway. And then, it, uh, then it, and using the nose wheel steering, and at 80 knots you were meant to take your hand off the nose wheel steering. So I took it off the nose wheel steering and immediately started to leave the centre line. So I thought oh, I'd better hang on to it. And as we went past Terminal 1, it all got a bit better. And then when we got past Terminal 3, we were hit with this massive gust. So I had to put in full right rudder. We just managed to keep the thing straight. We staggered off in, into the air. Um, and shortly afterwards, they closed the airport because the, the, the wind was 70 knots. Uh, it so happened the co pilot I was with had just come from the Air Force. And that was his body was very one of his very early flights. I don't think he was too impressed by all this. But that was an interesting day, shall we say. And um, again, as Al was saying, I was amazed how the 747 was affected by crosswinds until you realized, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, is that the fins in the 3000 foot wind. <laughs> so, so it really was affected by crosswinds. And uh, it, but again, it was beautifully controllable. Oh, fantastic. Well, it's wonderful to hear. Um, I mean, it's it's amazing to see you were right at the start of the British Airways 747s coming in. I was setting down his middle time. And for me, it was right at the start when I was a young girl. My earliest memories were flying on the jumbo. And I certainly remember the last one. I was stood with my mum on the roundabout at Terminal 5 in the rain. And we were cheering and clapping and watching Al go over. And it it really did give me goosebumps. And it's a, it's a very heartfelt day. Uh, and that being said, that comes to the end of our question and answer session. So I'll leave you with one last video to, uh, to get your heart racing and tissues out to, uh, to watch the jumbo for the last time before we hand over to our chair for some closing remarks. So thank you. Hello there, it's uh, Pete Fryer again. Time to go. Um, wow, tears in my eyes. We, um, we've all watched the jumbo go. I'm sat here now thinking to myself, cool, these electric aeroplanes and the hydrogen aeroplanes are coming along soon. Uh, I guess uh, Hugh and I have got to think, are we going to be around to see these things uh, arrive? But uh, I'm sat and I'm waiting. That's it. Thank you. On behalf of the committee and the members of the Heathrow branch, 
of the Royal Aeronautical Society. Al, Hugh and Ellie, I've got to thank you. It was absolutely wonderful listening to the questions. I wish you all the luck and health for the future. Thank you, William, our Honorary Secretary, for undertaking the administration which made today possible. I want to thank all of our members and our guests for watching. Um, I hope to see you again soon. Look after yourselves. Bye for now and thank you. From across the globe, from the centre of aerospace, and now to you. Thank you for downloading from the Royal Aeronautical Society. If you enjoyed this content, please consider showing your support for the Society. Share a link to this presentation by email or on your favourite social networks. If you have an interest in aerospace, consider the professional and personal benefits of membership. Visit www.aerosociety.com.